Um, we have a lot of partners in Bincoad. Um, for the sake of time, I won't go and listen all by name, but we are grateful for their collaboration. Um, instead, I'd like to do it, since this is the last humanity and technology event of the semester, I'd like to give you a preview of next semester's programming in the hopes that you will uh, come across campus and join us. Uh, so I have the time here. I do have the dates for the four events that we're going to have in spring 2020. Um, and it turns out that they are all authors and all their books speak to why we invited them. So I'm going to put the titles up here for your uh, interest. So on January 23rd, we have Jamie Madigan, who is both an author and a podcaster, and anymore, I don't know which is more important, probably the latter. Uh, so he is a psychologist who wrote a book called Getting Gamers, the so psychology of video games and their impact on people who play them. And Dr. Frank Logo, who is a psychologist here, has been using uh, Dr. Madigan's work in his own teaching. And we're very excited to have him out, um, because if you are a gamer or know another gamer, uh, then this talk is for you. Um, on March 31st, Dr. Schaffberg uh, from Georgia Tech uh, will be joining us. And he is the author of Technology, a Critical History of Concept, a book that just came out with uh, University of Chicago Press. Um, so Dr. Schaffberg's work is in science and technology studies. But again, this strikes me as a topic that speaks to all of our interests. So I do hope that you will come for that. Uh, April 23rd, Dr. Mar Hicks. Uh, their book title says it all. Programs and Inequality, How Britain is Started, Women Technologists, and Last Ditch Edge in Computing. This is actually goes back to the World War II Computing Technology in Britain, uh, but Dr. Hicks's work is very much dedicated to sort of questions of gender identity and technology and computer science. And then finally, this is another special collaboration. Uh, in April, on a date, will be determined, Dr. Empoli, uh, author of Flint Fights Back, Environmental Justice and Democracy in the Flint Water Crisis, uh, recently published by Emma Press, uh, will be giving a talk at Southfield Public Library. Um, so one of our partners is Southfield Library System. We've been grateful for their um, companionship along the way here, and they're going to be um, offering space and audience for Dr. Paul's work. So please do keep your eyes open for our posters, for our um, uh, tweets, all five of them. Uh, that's me, I'm working on it. Uh, we are also, we all are actually also starting a actual gym at email uh, page, email list. So at the end of the talk, I'm going to ask you to hold like three minutes to fill out a mini survey on today's events. And in that, you have the chance to sign up for our email list so you can direct emails only about our events. So now I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Um, Dr. Jitter Nolan is an assistant professor of architectural history at the University of Southern California. Her work engages issues of social justice, media technologies, and governmentality. She recently published The Neocolonialism of the Global Village uh, and has another book forthcoming from the University of Minnesota Press, provisionally titled Savage Mind to Savage Machine, Design, Racial Science, and the Ergonomics of the Spirit. She's the recipient of numerous grants and fellowships, including from the Graham Foundation for Art and Architecture, the Social Science Research Council, and the Doctor Academischer Ausdentist. Probably messed that up. Like that. Uh, her work has been published in various scholarly and online journals, including Gray Room, The Journal of Architecture, EFLUX, and Avery Review. Her talk today is entitled Pentecostal Technologies from Village Cybernetics to Social Media. Please join me in welcoming her. Um, thank you so much for coming. I'm just going to pull up my presentation here. Uh, and thanks very much to Paul for inviting me. Uh, I have to warn you, I have a especially nasty cold, and I'm hoping that my voice will make it through the presentation, um, and that my nasal uh, twang will not uh, be too irritating to listen to, so I'm completely stopped up. But, um, so my presentation tonight, I'll just bring it up here. Yep. Um, takes the starting point, the temporary relationship between electronic media and political culture. And it traces this phenomenon backwards uh, to the historical balance of 1978, showing how technology such as radio, television, the computer, and also cybernetic forms of architectural design were often thought of as means for circumventing political discourse and it's being what I think of as magical forms of authority and governmentality. So by magical, I refer to how these media were understood as capable of bypassing conscious thought uh, and capturing the listener or viewer uh, in more affective ways. Let's see, sorry, the presentation mode just went away. The slides are up, but it's not, um, it's, for some reason, it's not going to presentation mode, so the, it's not clicking to slides. I don't know if there's an AV assistant. I mean, I could just click through them like this, but um, I, I guess the AV guy left. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just, for now, I'll just click through like this, and then, um, if necessary, see what I mean? It's like, I, it's just in the usual mode, and I do slideshow from, it doesn't actually do well, the slideshow. Yeah, I mean, it, I, yeah, it just doesn't like do this. anything. Okay. I mean, I don't even care about notes. It's just uh, oh, somehow it won't. that doesn't even matter. It just isn't actually in the sort of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which all, all that means is I'll have to like scroll and one by one click on these, which I yeah. could do, but. I think that's right. That's so weird. What's that? <sighs> restarting the computer, restarting the. Um, yeah, we, we could try that. This computer's been glitchy, apparently. Yeah, I didn't know this. I should have thought of that. So that's that one. Oh, I just clicked it. Um, yeah, yeah, I can yeah. go to this. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's right. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so, okay, this, you may be familiar, you may recognize this uh, kind of misquoted thing on the that had been attributed to Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda in chief, uh, which has circulated recently to describe current media culture. Um, so although the statement clearly resonates with the extension of fake news and conspiracy theories, I think where it sort of misses the point is in its um, arguably obsolescent pretension of truth as a kind of 
um, as being relevant, really, for cultivating political support, right? The idea that people must believe something to be true in order to uh, support it. So whereas, in fact, what I'm going to be arguing is that the pleasure of loudness, right, and the comfort of repetition in and of themselves uh, may be more effective in generating political fervor and loyalties. So you, know, you can think of situations like concerts or political rallies in which loudness itself, regardless of the content, kind of breaks down barriers between self and non-self, right, and creates kind of, a, kind of an affective um, response. Um, so what I'm trying to get at here is sort of how strategies of populist demagoguery and fascism operate on the principle that the content of language is largely irrelevant. So the signifier-signified relationship, right, the relationship between a word and what the word refers to. Um, the signified, the referent, the thing that's referred to is largely unimportant. What matters is the mode of utterance and how that mode can establish a bond, uh, whether by aesthetic means or by other ways of dissolving boundaries between a medium and a self. Um, so it is mediatic effects rather than content that increasingly bind us and threaten to render um, actual political discourse obsolete. So I'm going to move now back into the 1950s uh, to the widely revered theory of Marshall McLuhan. For those of you in the audience, especially the younger generations who might not be familiar with McLuhan, he's a Canadian English professor, uh, sort of one of the media theorists who is most renowned for the expressions the medium is the message, which you might probably have heard, as well as the expression of the global village. So McLuhan is kind of the starting point here, as his work, his work's open on to um, kind of deep implications between the histories of various 20th century media and histories of late colonialism and Cold War cultural imperialism. So I'll be kind of drawing from McLuhan's notion of what I call Pentecostal technologies, which I'll explain in a moment, to argue that late 20th century developments in electronic media were very much driven by the perceived potential of the media to depoliticize populations through magical means of persuasion. So in his book, Understanding Media, and written and published in 1964, McLuhan writes, language as the technology of human extension may have been a tower of Babel by which men sought to scale the highest heavens. Today, computers hold out the promise of a means of instant translation of any code or language into any other code or language. The computer, in short, promises by technology a Pentecostal condition of universal understanding. The next logical step would seem to be not to translate, but to bypass language in favor of a general cosmic consciousness. We might be very like the collective unconscious. The condition of weightlessness may be paralleled by the condition of speechlessness that can confer a perpetuity of collective harmony and uh, peace. So you might detect in this passage the kind of influence of like beatnik and drug, you know, sort of um, alternative culture at the time. And McLuhan would indeed become a popular figure uh, in the 1960s countercultural movement, despite his own deep conservatism. Uh, but in short, this passage is lending itself to any kind of radical politics that could be sort of misguided, as McLuhan's Pentecostal fantasy is, in fact, uh, deeply apolitical. So I'm just being drawing your attention to a few parts of this here. Um, so the device that enabled the state of collective consciousness, the computer, was at this time bound up in the mythology of cybernetics, uh, basically the idea that technological systems could gradually take the place of human forms of, government, of governance. So computer control allowing society to behave as a kind of perfect self-regulating system of production and consumption. Um, so the connection to the Pentecostal, uh, for those of you who are familiar with this part of, it's a, of the Christ Christian scriptures, uh, the story goes that after Jesus' execution, his spirit uh, appeared his apostles and possessed them so that they began to speak in tongues, like so basically speaking in mutually unintelligible languages. But they could nonetheless understand each other, uh, being kind of spiritually connected. So what the main sense is that a content of language was no longer necessary for communication. It, so this myth suggests a kind of self-regulating system of a harmonious agreement, and sort of in McLuhan's telling. As far as this per perpetuity of collective harmony and peace, um, this invokes European Enlightenment era notions of perpetual peace that often assumed uh, that improved form of international communication would result in the erasure of differences or conflict. So this idea was reasserted, um, it sort of has its birth with the uh, European Enlightenment, but it was reasserted in the wake of World War I and World War II, with many scholars and state leaders suggesting that wars and internecine civil conflicts were the result not of conflicting interests between state actors and various polities, like not class conflict, for example, but of misunderstandings perpetuated by language, either by differences between languages, simply um, by the ambiguity of languages. So language is failure to be kind of perfectly and trans to perfectly and transparently connect thought, the thought of one person to the thought of another is what you know, supposedly led to conflict. Um, so I probably need to point out the kind of deeply apolitical implications of this assumption. Uh, let's presume that there are kind of no conflicts of interest, right? That we all kind of agree we're all the same. Um, and um, and it sort of also presumes, right, I mean, this is a kind of sentiment that's arising amidst sort of the colonial um, independence movements as well, right? So this idea that if we just understood each other, we'd all get along is kind of, um, you know, could be a sort of a kind of assertion of colonial power. Uh, indeed, one of McLuhan's English professors developed a drastically pared down version of the English language, basic English, as a means of simplified international communications, intended to eliminate misunderstandings and thereby estate perpetual peace among the governed of the world. And again, he proposed this in 1930, which means that amid the rise of these anti colonial movements in most of Britain's colonies, he was insisting conflict was simply a matter of language, not a matter of exploitive uh, relationships. Um, so see, this wheel is sort of showing how he can sort of pare down and mean it to a sort of essentialities. Uh, similarly, following the First World War, Herbert Bayer, a graphic design teacher at the Bauhaus, proposed transposing German script and orthography into what he called the pure essential graphic. So I'm showing here an English language equivalent of this that developed after emigrating to the United States. But the idea would be that all European languages would be translated into this new orthography and uh, graphic system. So this, this graphic aimed to kind of smooth out the visual and phonetic inconsistencies between Roman alphabet-based languages. 
as well as um, sort of internal idiosyncrasies like the German umlaut. Um, so we can kind of detect here the Pentecostal drift of this project in an effort to create a more transparent universal means of communication. Um, as would be more apparent in a later statement by Herbert Beyer that likely there would come a time when we no longer need to learn to read and write. We will instead absorb and convey information, not through eyes, mouth, and ears, but rather through supernatural means. And this idea of absorbing will sort of come up again and again throughout the, the presentation. Um, so the sequence I'm about to present here is, um, it's not really a proper history in the sense of, kind of a sort of unified body of um, kind of network of characters, but it's really a kind of genealogical um, accretion of examples taken from the latter half of the 20th century and intended to demonstrate how uh, Pentecostal technologies, as I call them, function as kind of a dispositif of governmentality, basically like a recurring strategy or logic that drove how new media were developed, especially in the context of global north-south relationships. So I'm going to, oh, oh no. <laughs> okay, sorry, I, I think it's okay. This, this um, presentation, I have some computer issues uh, and it's gone through many kind of iterations of losing content, but I, hope, I think it's okay. Um, so, what I'm going to be doing is breaking down this history of Pentecostal technologies into four kind of chapters, each with its own thesis. Um, I'm saying a thesis about what Pentecostal technologies are at given moments. Um, so I'm going to be kind of moving from the use of electronic media in the context of decolonial Africa, so, and subsequently turning to the context of um, development and village planning in the global south, and the related concept of uh, simple technologies for the global south. And I'll be concluding with uh, how the capitalist um, sort of for new markets for digital products in the global south informed the development of computer interface in the 1980s especially. And sort of finally then how this has shaped digital culture as we know it. So I'll come back to these images later on. Um, so thesis number one, that Pentecostal technologies supplement coercive forms of domination by creating a channel of like, magical communion between the governing and the governed. Um, oh, some of these images are, okay. Um, so this check begins the development of the colonial film unit as a vehicle for propaganda, primarily in Africa. Um, so this was an agency that was developed in the 1930s, and the content of the films that were shown were largely instructional, attempting uh, to reform hygiene and agricultural practices, for example. But some films were also kind of more explicitly uh, politically propagandistic, with footage showcasing like, the beauty of England, the glory of the British Empire. Um, so in the colonial film in its efforts to gauge the effectiveness of these films, one administrator ventured that the film's efficacy had little to do with their particular content, and much more to do with the medium itself. That is, the medium was, um, the, 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 that is, the medium was enchanting and kind of impressed upon doors the magical powers of British technology. So to put it in McClune's words, the medium was the message. It's not clear whether McClune had encountered this particular uh, administrative understanding of the power of British colonial film, but he was certainly well aware of the worth of the colonial film unit, attested by lengthy passages on the topic in his 1962 book, The Gutenberg Galaxy. Um, so recent his interest in the history of colonial cinema vans and radio vans have mostly focused on urban contacts, such as with Brian Larkin's work on uh, radio cinema in urban Nigeria. However, in the 1940s and 50s, radio and cinema vans began to be increasingly deployed in rural contexts, not because these areas were even more further beyond the purview of telecommunication infrastructures, but also because of economic programs in many of Britain's colonies to implement methods of agricultural intensification and cash crop development. So seeking to inculcate rural societies into programs of agricultural reform, colonial administrators devised means of overcoming the society's deep distrust of colonial programs. Uh, so subsequently, Britain's uh, late colonial wars, first in Malaysia and Kenya, rendered radio and cinema vans absolutely central to modes of colonial governmentality. The colonial use of electronic media would later capture the attention of Marshall McLuhan, so I'll come back to this. Um, so to understand uh, the turn toward electronic media in Kenya, it's necessary to have some kind of basic understanding of colonial policies in uh, Africa, especially in southern colonies like Kenya, uh, which had long lived often violently against African literacy and African urbanization. The colonial economy in Kenya was based on cash crop agriculture, taking advantage of the temperate climate of the Rift Valley, which was suitable for growing tea and coffee. So prior to colonialism, uh, Kenya's Rift Valley, which is kind of what I'm showing here, this central swath of Kenya, um, this valley had been primarily occupied and cultivated by the Kikuyu Nation, whose farmlands were seized by colonial settlers, as who were soon, uh, therefore, forced, forced to resettle in the overcrowded native reservations, and this is showing some of those native reservations there in the shaded area. Um, Deprived of their farmlands, many Kikuyu had little choice but to work on colonial plantations for paupers' wages. To keep the wages as low as possible, colonial settlers endeavored to prevent Kikuyu's eligibility for other forms of employment. So as many Kikuyu made their way to cities like Mombasa and Nairobi in search of work, the British instituted a passbook system which restricted Africans' movement to and from cities, similar to the passbook system that would shortly after be implemented in South Africa. Additionally, colonial settlers forcibly shut down Kikuyu schools, knowing that literacy was a valuable skill in the urban job market. Moreover, African literacy and urbanism posed threats not only to the colonial economy, but also to colonial governance more generally. And so far as reading, printing presses, at cities facilitated the mass mobilization of anti-colonial politics. For example, the Kikuyu Central Association launched an intensive literacy campaign in the 1930s, which was largely directed toward developing effective means of political expression, enabling Kikuyu to interpret and appeal to British law. 
Accordingly, uh, the Kikuyu nationalist movement mobilized print media as a means of political organization. And often they, uh, the schools they started were uh, kind of violently shut down, burnt. Um, so the threats that urbanization and literacy posed to the colonial, the colonial governance were perceived as two sides of the same coin. They kind of worked hand in hand, right? Because they're printing presses in cities, for example. Um, the colonial secretary marked of Kenya's nationalist leader, Tom Mboya, that, quote, one of his primary instruments is the African newspaper he owns called Uhuru, which was very largely in instrumental in encouraging the growth of the Kenyatta call, uh, Jomo Kenyatta being um, sort of the primary uh, nationalist leader. Another instrument at Mboya's disposal is the very large number of unemployed Africans who have drifted into Nairobi from the reserves. So the secretary proceeded to call for the dismantling of Mboya's newspaper and the simultaneous expulsion of all Africans from Nairobi. And this is just one of many instances of um, British militancy against the development of a kind of public sphere in Western Africa. And I'll come in a moment to how this inspired uh, McLuhan's theories of media. So by the 1950s, uh, dis disheartened frustrated factions of Kenya's independence movement branched off to form the militant Kenya-led Freedom Army, which I'll be referring to as the KLFA. With the subsequent outbreak of Kenya's war for independence, what the British refer to as the Mau Mau War, uh, the British instated a process of what they called villagization, a system for forcibly detaining thousands of civilians in camps throughout the Rift Valley as a way of kind of um, ch uh, keeping sort of intelligent food supplies of leaking out to the militants, right? They just kind of rounded up all the civilians. Uh, this is actually they'd already employed in uh, Malaysia during its anti-colonial war. Um, so, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> So the system of villagization um, provided also further means of removing urban Africans to rural areas. Yet the British attributed the violence of the KLFA not only to the dangers of urbanization and printing presses, but also to their opposite, to what they saw as the Kikuyu's excessive rural isolation. The British ethno-psychiatrist, this was a discipline in the 1950s, the psychiatry, um, the British psychiatrist John Colin Carruthers, who had been summoned to Nairobi to diagnose the KLFA insurgents, pronounced that the Kikuyu's alleged arboreal isolation led antisocial behavior, culminating in the violence of the anti-colonial war. The British were thus left with something of a puzzle, how to de-urbanize while simultaneously bringing the colonized more securely into the fabric of governmentality, right? So how to kind of de-urbanize while also de-ruralizing. So the solution lay in thinking of villagization, the system of civilian detainment camps, the device for transforming social patterns of settlement, assisted by the use of mass media propaganda. So basically by concentrating from these villages, they were reachable by these you know, van and radio vans. Um, so the neo-colonial implications of villagization clearly captivated McLuhan, who several years after the beginning of Kenya's war, dedicated the first 20 pages of Gutenberg Galaxy to discussing a short article by Carruthers, this ethnopsychiatrist, entitled Culture, Society, and the Written Word. In this article, Carruthers advanced the thesis that illiterate people entertained, um, a remain, sorry, that they remained under the primitive influence of the spoken word. Essentially, he said, Africans entertained a magical conception of language. And as will be seen in the presentation, I'll be pointing out to the magical drift of many um, sort of Euro-American media technologies. Um, um, so they entertained a magical con conception of language, he claimed, which rendered them too easily swayed by the charismatic authority of the spoken voice, leaving them incapable of exercising independent thought. So basically, he's saying that societies with higher rates of illiteracy were unfit for self-rule. Um, and you might remember, too, sort of contemporaneously with this in the United States, and McLuhan was um, teaching for many years in the United States before going to back to Toronto, um, that you know, literacy tests were being used right, as a way to kind of illegitimately ex um, exclude um, African-American voters from voting. Um, so it's, I feel like McLuhan is sort of aware of this in, in his kind of use of Carruthers' theories. Carruthers' claims became the premise for McLuhan's notion of the magical and stupefying effects um, exerted by electronic mass media. Clearly sympathetic to colonial power, McLuhan understood electronic media as a kind of paternalistic prophylactic to be applied in the global south against the politically liberating and modernizing effects that he attributed to literacy and print culture. So he, he wrote, sorry, um, he programmed 20 more hours of TV in South Africa next week to cool down the tribal temperature raised by video last week. Here he's paraphrasing a, sort of a media pundit. Whole cultures, this is his own words, could now with television be programmed to keep their emotional climate stable in the same way that we have begun to know something about maintaining equilibrium in the commercial economies of the world. Building on Carruthers' thesis about Africans' alleged enthrallment to the spoken word, Owen reasoned that if Africans were captivated by the supposed magic of an uh, aural, like this kind, A-U-R-A-L, an aural rather than written semiosis, then they would be best be governed through orality, as promulgated through mobile uh, cinema and uh, radio, mobile radio and cinema, uh, and eventually through television, which in Kenya was first implemented actually not in cities, but in a small village in the Kikuyu reserves. 
Um, a former Cambridge classmate of McLuhan argued that winning Britain's war against the KLFA was largely about leveraging native forms of media, claiming that in Africa, the main way in which ideas and news spread from tribe to tribe and within a tribe was the medium of dance and song. It may be that certain Africans would prefer to get their ideas in a normal European way, but there are an immense no number who would get those ideas more quickly and clearly if they were conveyed in what I would call the African medium. So based on Carruthers' theories concerning orality, McLuhan could argue that film and radio were effectively native forms of African media, because he likened the cognitive effects of um, what he called tribal drums to the effects of radio. In fact, radio was essentially an extension of Africans' own allegedly non-literate nature, I mean, all, this is all alleged, right, uh, and could therefore be implemented as a kind of pseudo-native form of authority. So you'll recall, just from this passage, that McLuhan's fantasy of a Pentecostal form of electronic media was envisioned as a, a universal condition, right? Not specifically colonial or neo-colonial. Effectively, colonial media strategies for foreclosing political discourse were reimagined by McLuhan as a kind of utopian condition of um, universal collective harmony and peace. Um, and indeed, this viewpoint was often articulated in cybernetic discourses at the time. I'm assuming there are some architect, architect students in the room. Um, so I'm going to be showing a few architects in the slides to follow. Um, so by cybernetic, I'm, I'm kind of referring to the mid-20th century project of developing these self-regulating systems that were often held out as ideal uh, modes of governance and urbanism. That was the case with Kenzo Tange's proposed reconstruction Tokyo, which conceived the city as a kind of novolic system of circulation that would sort of self-regulate. Um, but cybernetics also took root in co rural contexts where computation held out a promise for a systematic analysis of culture that could easily be translated, supposedly easily be translated, into a facial architectural form capable of integrating cultural practices into federal programs of modernization. Which brings me to my next thesis in the next chapter, um, that Pentecostal technologies aim to displace the political and micro-political processes through which societies might negotiate proposed reforms, for example, like modern, modernizing reforms. Um, it displaces these through subtle spatial and mediatic adjustments to daily habit. Um, so Pentecostal technologies were as I said, not only, they're not only applied in coercive, violent contexts, such as Kenya's war, but often seen as kind of non-coercive supplements to programs of development. In addition to film and radio, architecture, and I'll explain this image in a second, um, architecture was understood as key to shaping and reforming daily habits and perceptions of rural societies. Uh, seen in the early work of the architect Christopher Alexander, arising from his fieldwork in a rural village in Gujarat, India in uh, 1959. Um, so he, this is um, a small architectural project he did uh, while he was conducting kind of field work in this village for seven months, but I'll show you the kind of real project to come out of this in a second, which is the cybernetic one. Um, so at this time, uh, it's important to remember that rural India was central to Cold War strategies. Its rural poverty could easily impel a state like India to drift towards communism. So simultaneously, there was pressure in India to intensify agricultural production as a way to kind of fuel industrialization by providing a cheap uh, food supply to workers. Uh, it was also seen as a way to wean the state from uh, dependence on international food assistance. So hence, rural India was a site of intensive international and domestic developmental initiatives in the 1950s and 60s, initiatives that were often opposed by rural citizens themselves. Um, Post-independence post development in India included massive hydroelectric infrastructure projects throughout Gujarat, uh, which sub subjected countless villages to forced relocation. In this context of development and forced displacements, the architect Christopher Alexander arrived in the village of Bavra, bringing his own diverse disciplinary background to bear upon the project development. So for his bachelor and master's degrees, Alexander had studied mathematics, computer science, and architecture at Cambridge University, before then moving on to obtain a PhD in architectural design at Harvard, where he also forged collaborative relationships with psychologists and anthropologists at MIT and Harvard. Um, so his fieldwork in Bavra, as we'll see, was, was clearly influenced by the concerns of mid-20th century anthropology at a time when that discipline was itself often placed in the service of Cold War uh, politics. U.S. and British anthropologists during the Cold War often served as mediators between development initiatives and rural societies, hel helping determine how to best reach and reform rural persons. So it's in this context of massive rural displacement and agrarian development that Alexander proposed a method to s scientifically integrate anthropological observations into spatial configurations for purposes of village planning. He argued that in order to make architecture suitable for different globally dispersed societies, all that was needed was a special system of notation capable of transcribing social practices into spatial arrangements, so basically a graphic system that could kind of shuttle between cultural environments and spatial design. 
clearly inspired by his background in computer science, um, you can kind of glean from that image there. Um, Alexander generated a coded rubric of cultural criteria gleaned from his observations of rural life in Bavra, and he then classified these criteria according to a number of academies, like, uh, categories like uh, economy and um, sort of culture, family life, things like this, religion and beliefs. He then interpreted these criteria into, into kind of spatial configurations based, for example, on desired proximities between uh, different programmatic elements or conversely desired segregations between social groups. As was the case of many anthropologists at the time, though, his, who were hired, as I said, as agents of development, Alexander did not behave strictly as a transcriber of existing social practices. He acted also as an agent for transformation of those same practices. Well, aware of development projects, his list of cultural criteria, and this is just one example of many, um, were interspersed with other criteria. Alexander's proposed method then for seamlessly integrating existing social practices with proposals for reforming those same social practices upheld then a special prerogative of experts, uh, typically Euro-American experts, to determine which social and economic practices should be fixed as sort of immutable cultural essentialities and which ones should be subject to transformation. Um, so there were some reforms that were you know, deeply desired by rural residents. So for example, the schoolhouse that I showed in the first slide was um, you know, something that the residents of Bavra asked for. And another um, reform that rural residents often desired in India was for land redistribution in order to um, kind of redress the extremely exploitative sort of feudal system of um, agricultural labor. However, sort of British and US policy, Cold War policy was uh, very strictly against any kind of land redistribution as it was seen to be too closely aligned to Maoist communist um, objectives. Um, so what I'm suggesting here is that the negotiation of which reforms were desirable and which were not desirable might rightfully have transpired in the domain of political or micro-political processes and would likely uh, re have relied to a large extent on language as a mode of argument negotiation. In opposition to political processes, right, in the use of language, Alexander's system of village design operated more as a Pentecostal technology intended to circumvent disagreement and discussion around issues of reform, while at the same time appearing to proceed directly from local cultural requirements. Couched as a kind of indigenous extension of culture, the design method was really sort of like a Trojan horse, carrying beneath its exterior various modernizing reforms um, within this kind of framework of cultural authenticity. Um, and keeping in mind, too, that the reason that for this kind of proposal was really the, the um, kind of rash of forced resettlements that were prompted by the hydroelectric developments in the area. Um, so design was effectively used to forestall political confrontation between local customs and modernizing reforms by attempting to spatially reconcile contradictory agenda. So certain elements of the scheme, such as what's pictured here diagrammatically, um, the domestic quarters, these replicated existing practices of caste segregation, despite you know, some of his claims to kind of move away from caste segregation. Um, and these are, this, this kind of basically arranged clusters of families um, according to their kind of caste affiliations uh, in these kind of discrete compounds that were walled off and forced both caste purity as well as feminine modesty. Um, on the other hand, the design of public space effectively skirted the question of whether to support or challenge caste politics. Alexander noted the importance of the community center, but see that any such central meeting space ran the risk of being, quote, associated with one party or group or certain families, so basically being you know, dominated by one caste, and thus would not contribute to social at all, he wrote. To resolve this dilemma, he proposed instead of a central square, um, what he called a linear center, which is basically, so it's not really a center, but he calls it a linear center that would zigzag between the different compounds. So in other words, to prevent one group's domination of public space, this kind of tiny attenuated public, a tiny public space would be accorded to each caste group, um, to each of these kind of enclaves, and these little spaces would be connected, right, by a serpentine path. Um, but you know, the spaces themselves would then be receded from the pack and nestled between the compounds. So clearly these public spaces were, were marked as a reserved domain of a particular caste-based group. So if central public space ran the risk of domination by one group, at the very least, the centrality of that space, its kind of hypothetical availability to all, would have rendered, and the very fact of its centrality would sort of mark that hypothetical availability, right? Um, this, would have rendered the domina this would have rendered such domination a visible matter of public concern, thus opening up the possibility of contesting that domination. In other words, public space, by indexing relationships of power, also provides a ground upon which to test and transgress, possibly, such power. Rather than contesting the relationships of domination that might have been asserted within that space, Alexander was simply eliminating a platform where those relationships might have become a matter of public concern and political action. 
the diminishment of politics appears in another aspect of this proposed serpentine path, namely that the walls framing the path could provide a kind of didactic platform being inscribed, Alexander wrote, with the alphabet and messages written in such a way that their continuing presence forces people to absorb them. While he didn't specify what kinds of messages might be inscribed on the walls, we can deduce from other aspects of his um, proposal that they were likely related to the agenda of development. Um, so the presumed efficacy of habitual exposure was also evident in Alexander's approach to agricultural modernization. And you can't read from this, sorry, I don't have a pointer, but this sort of area down here is showing the kind of various sort of agricultural fields that were part of the, um, this village configuration. Um, agricultural demonstration farms and mob farms programs begun under colonialism and continued under national development schemes, required, Alexander noted, not a physical plan so much as, quote, a change of attitude in the villagers. Um, this change of attitude, he wrote, cannot be brought about by sporadic visits from the agricultural extension officers and village level workers, but only by the continuing presence of demonstration methods on site. There should be a demonstration farm placed such a way that every farmer passes it daily on his way to and from the field. Alexander's makes the state's infrastructure of modernization dissolve into the architecture of the village, camouflaging top-down agenda uh, within a strategy of cultural preservation, basically. So kind of making top-down things almost appear as if they're bottom-up. Attempting to avoid either state-sponsored coercion on, or, on the other hand, rural resistance, Alexander implies that habitual state-conscious exposure to information might prove, prove, prove a more effective and non-coercive weapon against peasant recalcitrance. Um, you know, more effective in efforts to explain and negotiate. So with this, I arrive at my third thesis, that Pentecostal technologies camouflage relation the relationships of power that they often work in the service of, often by masking themselves as indigenous and by encouraging user participation. Um, oops. So the architects in the room might be familiar with the architect Jonah Friedman, um, known especially for his proposed megastructure, such as this one. But I'll be looking here really at his forays into other media, including computer-aided design. In 1969, Friedman, who had emigrated a decade earlier from Israel-Palestine, where he'd been a refuge from the Holocaust, um, to France, he uh, he, after immigrating to France, he began to produce for UNESCO a series of didactic educational cartoon pamphlets intended uh, for distribution among communities with low rates of literacy in the Global South. The cartoons explicated uh, various low-tech means of habitation and subsistence intended to improve the lives of rural or peri-urban communities, or often rural to urban migrants, as you can see here. Local resistance to these kinds of top-down reforms placed on the pamphlets the burden of um, not just explanation, but above all, of generating trust. As such, the cartoons functioned as a kind of pseudo-vernacular. Since the cartoons were intended for global distribution, they did not imitate any particular local form of media, as was the case in many development efforts um, led by anthropologists, where anthropologists were helping to translate developmental propaganda into kind of conventional local forms of theater and music, using puppets, things like, and even like magic lanterns. But as distinct from those efforts, Friedman proposed a kind of universal vernacular. Uh, you know, uh, excuse the paradox, but that's sort of what it is, a universal vernacular in the form of the stick figure. So, Several years after he'd begun this work, uh, Friedman proposed to UNESCO a kind of expansion of his medium, calling for further, quote, uh, vernacularization of UNESCO's development propaganda. He proposed the use of low-cost wall journals, basically mural-sized cartoons affixed to an exterior wall in a visible public area, which would present techniques related to what Friedman called the science of survival. So according to Friedman, the goal here was to transform the behavior of, quote, the man on the street to overcome his distrust of such propaganda. Thus, it was important that this man on the street be given proof, Friedman wrote, in lieu of mere abstractions. It is curious that cartoon drawing should serve as proof of the proposed techniques. What Friedman perhaps meant was that drawings could translate economic programs and techniques into the anthropomorphic register of personal experience, right? The stick figure to kind of cipher to stand in for each viewer's own self, right? This kind of, kind of identity that can be formed. Um, so the pseudo-folksy idiom of the stick figure uh, was designed, Friedman wrote, to be easily copyable, though it was also surely intended to look non-expert. Distrust would be overcome then by dint of an imagistic power to create instant fictional identifications between the viewer and the practices depicted. Prose was considered alienating, whereas anthropomorphic imagery was kind of compellingly intimate. Friedman's interest in shaping media in relation to a global um, southern indigent 
found the most cogent realization with a project proposed at the United Nations University, the UN, uh, UNU, for a museum of some technology in Chennai, India. Designed by Friedman and the Austrian architect Ada Schauer, who at the time was teaching uh, at the School of Architecture in Ahmedabad, the museum was described by the architects as part of the much needed center for communication. In a short article published in India's Journal of Extension Systems, Friedman described the mission of the museum slash communication center. So I'm going to be quoting length here. The staff animating the museum combined competence about new scientific achievements with substantial sociological experience in order to guess what innovations might be accepted by the target public. Besides that, the same team has to be expert in communication techniques and in media, sophisticated or simple. The communication techniques implemented by the center include inexpensive, I'm still going here from Friedman, include inexpensive presentations like wall journals or posters, more sophisticated ones like animated cartoon features, and finally, some highly complex operations like the Museum of Civil Technology. In its role as a medium of demonstration, as a one-to-one -one scale exposition of simple technology, and as a platform for other exhibitions, the museum's architecture had to perform a difficult double function. The medium architecture had to seduce by virtue of its material allure, while simultaneously presenting itself as a humble extension of existing local practices. The architects designed the museum and as a series of bamboo domes supported on a base of two columns and brick infill walls. The bamboo mats draped over the roof structure were built by local basket makers, and like the bamboo structure, were wrapped in a, a sort of just an aluminum foil. <clears throat> The museum complex looks something like a cluster of modest brick huts topped by a glittery sculptural filigree uh, that was exotic, while nonetheless drawing on local material techniques. There's this kind of simultaneous sort of like seduction, but also this sort of appearance of being humble. Hence, the architecture acted as a material counterpart to the hybridity required of the communication center staff, combining kind of techno-scientific expertise with a locally attuned sociological discernment of na native proclivities. The presentation, Friedman wrote, has to appeal to the knowledge already possessed by the target public. This mandate to appear to tell locals what they already knew, anticipated developmental initiatives in the decades to follow, including with the spread of digital media. Several years before his involvement with the Museum of Simple Technology, Friedman had in fact made forays into more complex technologies through his collaboration with Nicholas Negroponte, an architecture professor at MIT, who would go on to become um, a founding director of MIT's Media Lab. At Negroponte's invitation, Friedman participated in the design of a software application called Flagger, which would allow future occupants of low-cost housing to choose from a menu of options, leading to the configuration of a kind of specialized housing unit tailored to each occupant's needs or desires. So like Alexander's proposal, this project resumes context in which urban residents in the global south were being resettled voluntarily or involuntarily, uh, and Edgar Ponte was especially interested in Latin American cities. So the software essentially serves as a device for generating consent, right, in situations where residents be strongly disinclined to move to large apartment buildings without any access to land. Um, <clears throat> moreover, it imagines the challenges of urban resettlement as a matter of spatial configuration, um, where, you know, basically, where do you want your toilet, as you can see in this particular uh, illustration, um, rather than a matter of so social negotiation around issues of land tenure, economic needs, access to employment and transportation and markets, the factors that are really relevant in issues of resettlement. In the 1970s, frustrated by the limits of computation as an aid to architectural design, Negroponte's architecture machine group at MIT turned increasingly away from computer-aided design and graphics and toward the spatial design of computation itself. So basically the design of user interfaces. And eventually in the early 1980s, the architecture machine group branched off to um, the architecture department to form um, the MIT Media Lab. So in looking at a few seminal projects related to the, the Media Lab, right, as a way of, I'm gonna do, be doing this as a way of demonstrating my penultimate thesis, um, <clears throat> that toward the end of the Cold War under neoliberal reforms, Pentecostal technologies were increasingly guided by a late capitalist expansion of technology exports into the global south. And that efforts to reach rural, often non-literate markets um, very much affected the design of digital technologies. So around 1980, Negroponte and his MIT colleague Seymour Papert were invited as consulting experts to the Centre Mondial Informatique in Paris, an agency that was responsible for advancing France efforts to expand its technological export markets, largely by identifying Francophone Africa as a huge untapped market for personal computing technologies. So Negroponte kind of picks up on this economic strategy and brings it back to the media lab. Um, so the, the linguistic aspect of this economic strategy, right, France's focus on former French colonies, is important because personal computers at the time, uh, some of you will, like myself will remember, um, they were, they either required um, the use of complex programming languages, uh, which, you know, necessitated sort of trading and expertise, 
Um, but they were increasingly kind of, um, being used through simpler programming languages, such as BASIC and then MS-DOS uh, in the United States. Which, and these kind of simpler programming languages made use of natural languages, so they would use like, English prompts like print or stop. Um, so these user-friendly programming languages were thereby specific to kind of dominant languages, such as English or French or Japanese, like these countries that were um, producing electronic exports. Um, so on the other hand, the Xerox Star system in the United States, launched in 1981, was the first personal computer to implement the graphic user interface based on the desktop in the form using icons and a pointy device rather than um, typogra typographical input. It was largely the work of David Canfield Smith, whose PhD dissertation, Pygmalion, a creative programming environment, had called for an interface that would more closely resemble the nature of human thought. Invoking the Greek myth of Pygmalion, in which um, the chasm between the medium of representation and reality, between basically sculpture and the human uh, that the sculpture represents, is kind of magically effaced. Um, <clears throat> Evoking this myth, Smith claimed that thought was primarily a visual rather than verbal matter. Citing Peppert from the MIT Media Lab, he described words as flawed indices, pointers to concepts, rather than as constitutive of thought in their own right. And the MIT researchers were at the same time similarly engaged in um, developing graphic user interfaces based on the, the desktop metaphor. Hence, when Peppert and Negroponte traveled throughout Francophone Africa, with the Santo Mondiale Informatique uh, in the early 1980s, they used their fieldwork there to demonstrate the superfluity of language as a means of human machine interaction. So, comparing his fieldwork in Dakar, the capital of Senegal, with his experiences outside the city in rural villages, Negroponte claimed, quote, that kids from the jungle learned faster than kids from the city. What he meant by this, seemingly, was that literacy was unnecessary to computer use. So we have to read the statement in the historic context of the early 1980s when rampant structural adjustment programs were being um, implemented uh, sort of forced, uh, coercively in the global south. And there was these structural adjustment programs were basically slashing funding for social programs such as education. So the fact that computers could be used by non-literate children meant that an export market for personal computer imports could be cultivated in Africa and elsewhere without the need for state-sponsored programs in literacy. Um, so as with any Pentecost technology, this is, um, you might be familiar with the One Laptop Per Child project, which I'll describe in a moment. <clears throat> uh, as with any Pentecostal technology, computers intended for export to the global south, and especially into rural areas, were designed to appear as innately trustworthy. So the Media Lab's decades-long uh, One Laptop Per Child initiative, which aimed to basically, as it's saying, give a laptop to every child in the world, um, <clears throat> This initiative, led by Negra Ponte, used school children as a means of uh, sort of carving out new markets for digi digital exports, kind of cultivating these markets, um, designing the computer to appear and behave as a toy, eliminating language in favor of uh, visual icons for its interface. Indeed, although the computer was touted as promoting learning and literacy, in the interest of cost engineering, the screen's pixel resolution was so drastically reduced that reading any kind of substantial text on the screen proved extremely challenging. Indeed, what children seemed to be learning through the computer was simply how to use a computer for the sake of learning to use a computer, um, which is you know, very much true in uh, the United States today as well. Um, so the One Laptop Per Child project was hardly unique in its efforts to enhance the toy-like character of personal digital devices. It simply kind of renders more explicit the widespread tendency in the 1980s and onward to appeal to users' psychic drives towards pleasure gratification, right? So culminating things like Facebook's like, like mechanisms, these things that have kind of inst an instant sort of pleasure response, right? Um, <coughs> in the interest, <coughs> sorry, of uh, bringing us back to the contemporary issue with which we began, related to the invitation of politics, news, and social media, I just want to very briefly refer, I don't have an illustration for it, so I'm using a contemporaneous one that is related. Um, but I want to refer to Negroponte's proposal in the early years of the MIT Media Lab for a smart newspaper. So basically a digital medium that would incrementally learn what topics interest you and then feed you related news and based on those preferences. So basically what we have today um, on our, with our online newspapers and other media platforms. <clears throat> um, and so with this I want to come to my final uh, thesis, which is that Pentecostal technologies displace political discourse by rendering politically oriented transmissions into a form of phatic communication. Um, so phatic communication, <coughs> the term coined by the early 20th century anthropologist Malinowski, and then later taken up by the linguist Roman, uh, Roman Jakobson, and it refers to forms of language that are significant um, as kind of social rituals that reinforce social relationships. 
but, um, but whose English content is largely irrelevant. So like a classic example of that, you know, you say, how do you do? I'm not really asking you how you're doing. It's just like a, a way of establishing a social um, a kind of, a, it's a, a recognition of interpersonal contact. Um, so I'm proposing that recent forms of electronic media have intensified a tendency of political discourse to serve as a means of phatic communication, as a means of establishing interpersonal bonds, um, rather than as serving as a means of collectively or personally parsing and negotiating complex issues and conflicting interest. So as such, we kind of inhabit specialized zones of social media and broadcast media um, you know, that essentially tell us what we already know, which is, again, was what Yona Friedman was sort of seeking for a media that would seem to tell you what you already know. Um, so because these, media, these messages, these political transmissions, often don't tell us anything we don't already know or already agree with, um, <clears throat> Uh, unless I be accused of doing the same thing right now, right, because we're all very well aware of this effect, I want to bring this, um, what sort of one, this issue back one last time into history, specifically to the colonial history, as a way of stressing how media culture associated with democratic state institutions um, has deep kinships with colonial forms of hegemony. Um, so I'm returning to kind of the sort of conclusion of uh, Britain's war against Kenya's independence movement. So the use of propaganda in Britain's war against the independence movement was part of a hearts and minds campaign that the British increasingly perceived to be ineffectual in converting Kikuyu civilians into British loyalists. Not long after the outbreak of war, the British were seized by a kind of mounting hysteria around the practices of the Kikuyu uh, Land and Freedom Army to extract loyalty oaths from both fellow militants and from civilians. The British believed that these loyalty oaths possessed a magical power over the Kikuyu, so magical that it allegedly transformed the oath takers' physiognomy and kept the oath, taker, oath takers in thrall to the influence of the militant insurgents. Um, so this is, and this is what the, the British believe. The British believe that these oaths actually transform the people who take the oaths. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so clearly, the British obsession with these oaths uh, was kind of at the heart of Carruthers' theories about Africans' alleged subject to the magic of the spoken word. Accordingly, in 1955, Carruthers, this ethnopsychiatrist, drawing on the anthropological work of Louis Leakey, proclaimed that the key to eradicating Kikuyu civilian support for the nationalist insurgency lay in counteracting the magical power of the loyalty oaths. On Carruthers' advice, the colonial administration instituted a ritual process of de-oathing, to be administered by Christian clerics as a step towards rehabilitating Kikuyu civilians. <clears throat> so British rituals of purification, which involved uh, priestly incantations and magical cleansing rituals, were to kind of lead up to the oath taker's eventual recanting of the oath, sort of a dis disavow of the loyalty oath. Kikuyu civilians deemed to be purified were then considered eligible for benefits such as receiving much coveted agricultural land and thereby entering into the incipient ruling class of African elites during the transition to Kenya's independence in the years to follow. So what I want to stress here is the importance the British placed on the phatic ritual of de-oathing, or really in turning oathing itself into a kind of nothing more than a phatic ritual, and how this involved canceling out the content of Kikuyu speech, canceling out the meaning of the declaration to stand by a political cause, so this ritual effectively evacuated political speech of its content, divorcing uh, the profession of loyalty from the actual content of loyalty. In effect, <clears throat> a magical form of semiotic subjectivity was being instated among the Kikuyu as a substitute for a political form of subjectivity. Magical deothing rituals paved the way for the experience of electronic media as a way of binding subjects without needing to substantiate precisely what they were being bound to. Years later, Clinton illustrated his dictum that the medium is the message by alluding anecdotally to, quote, an African who took great pains to listen each evening to the BBC News, <coughs> sorry, even though he could understand nothing of it, that's at least what McLuhan claims, um, just to be in the presence of sounds, McLuhan writes, at 7 p.m. each day was important for him, end quote. So today, um, electronic media has allowed political leaders, demagogues, to have a kind of strangely immediate presence, right, in the lives of their constituencies partly because the demigods communicate to us through the same exact channels that we use to communicate with our loved ones, right, and our friends, uh, kind of reaching us sporadically throughout the day, um, through our telephones, our Twitter accounts. <clears throat> when these deeply intimate devices, these kind of digital, digital prosthetics of the self, become channels of political rhetoric, that rhetoric, too, becomes a kind of indigenized extension of the self. So by way of conclusion, I simply kind of want to point out that um, <clears throat> The perpetual peace, the kind of Pentecostal condition of understanding of Quillen Bin comes in a perverted form. There is a kind of atomized form of perpetual peace that sort of adheres among members of the kind of subculture or class. Um, 
as they kind of circulate messages that comfortingly tell us um, already, what we already know. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'm very fast losing my voice, but, um, <clears throat> but, uh, but I'll happily take any questions. So if you have some time for some questions, just ask that you ask the question in the mic so we get it for the recording, and John's going to be passing the mic around. So put those hands up high so people can see it and we can questions. Yes? <coughs> Thank you for a beautiful presentation. Um, in terms of your um, kind of the cases uh, focusing on rural communities, uh, would, you, would it be prudent to say that Pentecostal technologies, as developed by McLuhan and interpreted by you, works or are more effective in sites of relative isolation, conservatism, and education, or I mean, does it matter in cities? Well, I mean, the term Pentecostal technology, of course, I'm sort of using very broadly, so it can include many things. I, I think it's important that, and I'm glad that you picked up on the fact that you know, it was often developed, they were often developed to sort of theorize and conceptualize in rural contexts, because I think this is where there was seen to be the greatest barrier, not only in kind of a lack of literal infrastructure, but the greatest sort of cultural barriers, right, where there's not a kind of urban elite, right, uh, sort of in the median class. But that being said, I don't think that that, I mean, I was showing this to be kind of the genesis of their logic, but not the kind of end of, not, not, not sort of defining where they end and their possible applications. I mean, because I think certainly in urban societies today, we kind of, you know, we all kind of use Pentecostal technologies. Um, I don't know, do, do, do you agree with that or? Uh, I don't know the answer. I mean, I think so. I was also thinking, I mean, uh, coming from India, an independence movement against colonialism, I mean, it really gathered steam when Gandhi really used the rural mass and a lot of the similar ideas, but in a very different way to promote health, hygiene, and try to eradicate some of the caste systems. Yeah. And before that, most of the anti-colonial movement was restricted to cities, and it was very easy for uh, British to kind of quash that to some extent. Um, so I was just thinking that, yes, I mean, we do use in everyday life today, uh, but probably it's more effective in certain kind of situations. Well, I mean, I think that's because with, you know, with Gandhi's rhetoric about sort of the village as the kind of basic unit of democracy, I think that this sort of then, like in the post independence it kind of intersects with these developmental um, projects that really sought to kind of anthropologize, right, the kind of ways in which they are reaching rural societies by kind of seeing them as these kind of privileged remains of a certain kind of culture and democratic culture, which, you know, on bed car is somewhat disputes, right? But, um, so yeah. Thank you. No, thank you. Everyone's too busy looking at their Pentecostal technologies. <laughs> Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Um, um, when I think of the word um, Pentecostal and of uh, sort of the um, Christian Pentecostal tradition, which you don't know a lot about, but from what I do know, um, there is a sense that after an, an individual is touched or um, you know starts to speak in tongues and is somehow um, granted a, a gift right, or this beneficence, that they're somehow transformed. Right, they're, they're like a different person than they were before that experience. Right, um, you have the sense that these um, uh, colonial uh, administrations or these colonial projects sought to transform the people, um, you know, the, the, the local people that they um, kind of uh, put these Pentecostal technologies on or aimed, or aimed these Pentecostal technologies at. Um, did you feel like there was a sense that, um, you know, they were trying to transform them or, or improve them, um, or was it just sort of like keeping the natives down, you know, keeping the, the, the masses? Sort of I, mean, I think it depends on, like I said, I, mean, I, I kind of, you know, do a very broad sort of genealogy. I think that, um, you know, for sort of development experts, right, there was a desire to really sort of transform people in subtle ways, right? So sort of, but, um, but I think that, and sort of specifically towards kind of certain kind of agenda, right? Like sort of modernizing agenda that had to do with sort of the rational, you know, sort of developing our sense of kind of economic rationality, right, as, as understood um, by like the United States and Britain. But, the, um, but I think in the case of the colonialism, there was clearly like with Carruthers and McLuhan and some of the other characters sort of related to the propaganda that was, I mean, McLuhan had no direct, I should sort of point out, McLuhan was not directly involved in any of this uh, stuff that was going on in Kenya. He was just reading about it through Carruthers and was very interested in it. Um, but he, um, but I think there was definitely, a, you know, he was understood as mesmerizing, right, as kind of enchanting. And, and that's how they, so when Carruthers was theorizing that, you know, claiming that Africans were, you know, enthralled to the magic of the, the spoken word, he was reading this or thinking of the ways in which British were going to kind of use media as a kind of magically captivating device. So I think it was, I mean, to say transformative, I don't know if it was, transformative so much as like kind of binding, right? Um, and that's one fun because your question reminded me, I'm, I'm glad you sort of mentioned Pentecostal religions because I'm not using Pentecostal, I should just kind of clarify, I know you're not suggesting this, but um, I'm not using Pentecostal in the sense of actual Pentecostal um, religious groups, right? But just in a kind of this, this sort of Pentecostal concept itself. Um, but yeah, so I think with many of the figures, it was definitely seen as like, you know, kind of these, these technologies, like radio and film, were seen to kind of, to have a kind of numinous effect, right? Where you're sort of, you know, sort of trans you're sort of lifted out of yourself, right? And kind of jo joined with the medium, right? You can just like, you know, loud music, for example, you're kind of joined to the medium somehow. Does that make sense? Thank you. Oh. <clears throat>
actually, at last point, I do have a comment because I was just at a talk where someone was talking about Marshall McLuhan Catholicism, which I didn't know about. Yeah. It was about Catholic, so yeah. it was used to Pentecost. I think it would have been a very specific kind of, um, like, more like biblical narrative than, than the kind of Pentecostal movement. Yeah. That's my suspicion. But um, I want to go back to um, the, it's Benedict Anderson, right? The idea of imagined communities and the kind of early stages of the nation state and the role that literacy plays yeah. there. Because yeah. I'm curious, like, to hear the compare and contrast between the way, like, yeah. literacy is, it doesn't have quite that affective absorption media that, like the sound or the like has, but there is the sense in which uh, his thesis, as I understand, is that you know, newspapers create this. And novels. Yeah, yeah, and novels create yeah. the sense of like a men in oneness that does have affective and results. Yeah, yeah. And so, having a national, a dominant national. Yeah, language. yeah. I'm really interested in the binary yeah. of language and tech in your talk. Well, so, <laughs> yeah, to me, this is something that in some ways, I see, you know, media producing that kind of imagined community, but it's, it's like I'm saying, it's kind of a community without content in, the same, in a way that is slightly different. Um, but I think that, you know, with with Edison's work, as well as with um, Parth and Patterson's like, earlier work on sort of the, the nation, national imaginaries, right? That these, these are kind of, they're looking at an elite, right? It's a literate elite in these places, usually. Um, so uh, people who have access to, to newspapers and novels, for it to matter. And I think that um, it's important that, you know, in, most, in the post-colonial kind of period, that in most of these places, most people are necessarily literate or do not have access to, you know, these kind of media that the rural societies were largely kind of left out of an imagined community. It was more of, I think, an urban phenomenon in many respects. Um, so, I mean, you know, in his sort of later edition to that book, Benedict Anderson, he kind of appends this sort of um, chapter on, I don't know if you know, this version with the museum and the census and the map. And so there he actually is talking about these other forms that are sort of more about, sort of more about governmentality in a certain sense through kind of imagery and things like that as opposed to, you know, as opposed to literature. But, yeah. Yes? Or, so, okay, yeah. Okay, so bear with me. Mm -hmm. So in your presentation, you make some parallels between these uh, colonizing forces using, uh, the illiterate or like the impoverished is the revolutionary vanguard for their purposes and kind of what's happening now uh, in our political climate, like the way that they're using, um, I guess like people that might be considered illiterate as a means to like disseminate information. And my question is, if you are one of those people that like, they're aiming their political message at, how do you uh, resist that? How do you like understand or like teach people to understand that something not right is happening and protect themselves? I mean, I mean to me, so much of this is bound up with like education systems and um, that we've, you know, have, not only a deeply, deeply segregated and deeply unequal education system in this country, but um, but a system that has been increasingly kind of valued for humanities and humanities-based learning. Because I think it's it's kind of interesting that like in Italy they've sponsored an initiative to teach children to school children to discern between fake news and kind of actual news, which which to me is like it makes sense in a certain le level, but at some level it's not about that even, right? It's about sort of the ability to kind of parse complex ideas and be able to hold conflicting ideas in your head at the same time, right? Without having to sort of shut out one and say this is you know, sort of seeing things in black and white. Um, mm. I, mean, I can't speak personally to how one sort of personally addresses the individual, but I do think that, um, you know, the kind of Im gradual and increasing impoverishment of humanities in, you know, primary school, pre tertiary education is largely behind a lot of this. But, yeah. Did you have a question? No. no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I'm going to put a URL here, and it will take you, uh, it will take you about less than three minutes.